Now let's conclude our discussions in Chapter 12 within the central nervous system. We have two topics left to discuss. First, we're going to discuss how we protect our brain and spinal cord. And then we're going to discuss the spinal cord itself. We have previously gone through all the different portions of the brain. We protect our brain with our skull. Then directly underneath our skull, we have a set of membranes called the meninges. Below or deep to the meninges, we have a layer of cerebrospinal fluid. The spinal fluid gives our brain some buoyancy and gives it a nice watery cushion. Then underneath the cerebrospinal fluid, we have what most people call the blood-brain barrier. The bone itself is fairly self-explanatory. We've already talked about bone and the different portions of the skull and the spinal cord. So now let's take a little closer look at the meninges. The meninges cover both the brain and the spinal cord. The meninges are composed of three different layers. Within the meninges is where the cerebrospinal fluid is found. So this picture down here is showing us outside the skin then underneath the skin, the periosteum and the bone. Then directly below the bone, first we can see the two layers of the outermost portion of the meninges called the dura mater. The dura mater is the thicker, tougher portion of the meninges. Below the dura mater is the, uh, dura, is the arachnoid matter. The arachnoid matter, from its name, should tell you it's going to have a spider web look to it. And that's what we see here. You have the real thin, clear layer. And then below that, you have all of these little spider web type projections. That is the arachnoid matter. In the subarachnoid space, below this thin layer here, and within the little spider web looking stuff, that's where we find our cerebral spinal fluid. That is also going to be the location of various blood vessels and where the blood-brain barrier comes into play. Below the arachnoid matter is the pia matter. The pia matter is a very thin, delicate membrane that lies directly on top of the cerebrum. And as you can see, it surrounds a gyrus of the cerebrum, and the pia matter even dips down into the sulcus of the cerebrum. The cerebral spinal fluid does more for us than just to provide that watery cushion. The cerebral spinal fluid is mainly made of water. It has less protein and a little bit different ion concentration than blood, but some of the cerebral spinal fluid is produced from things that move from the blood into this fluid. It is very important that the cerebral spinal fluid maintain a constant volume. The, a slight change in this volume results in an unbearable spinal headache that really tells the person that they are not allowed to do anything else until they lay down and make their body get that spinal fluid back to its correct volume. The cerebral spinal fluid helps to make the central nervous system organs lighter, helps protect them, and provides them nourishment by bringing the nourishment from the brain. Things are by bringing nourishment from the blood. Things are moved from the blood into the spinal fluid through the choroid plexuses. Choroid plexuses hang from each ventricle. One of the most obvious choroid plexus is found within the fourth ventricle. It's one you can see the easiest. As the, the way this works, blood flows through a capillary. The capillary is pressed against the lining of the ventricle so this is going to be ependymal cells. Things that are good for us, such as glucose, oxygen, vitamins, different ions that we need, will leak out of the capillary, pass through the ependymal cell, and go into the ventricle, helping form the spinal fluid. Anything that's in the spinal fluid that needs to come out is most likely going to be a waste product produced by the brain cells. It will go in the opposite direction, push through the ependymal cell, and then go back into the blood. This is a very selective process. Very few things are allowed to leave the blood and move into the spinal fluid. The choroid plexus provides us with what we call our blood-brain barrier. It is very selective. 
Now let's take a look at the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a collection of neurons that moves for out of the brain through the skull opening called the foramen magnum and continues down within the vertebrae and the meninges all the way down until about the area of vert lumbar vertebrae number one. Your spinal cord does not continue all the way into your coccyx. Your spinal cord is a two-way highway. It is an area where all of your sensory information comes into the spinal cord and then travels up to your brain for processing. The spinal cord is also the area where all of the motor neurons that are going to bring the information that movement needs to happen from your brain out to the outer regions of the body. Along your spinal cord, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that exit out of the spinal cord. Each spinal nerve exits out of the spinal cord with two different branches. One branch is going to be exclusively for sensory information, and one branch is going to be exclusively for motor information, and we will see that in just a moment. The, after the area of lumbar vertebrae number one, we no longer call it spinal cord. It then becomes the cauda equina. And it's called this because it kind of looks like a horse's tail. It is simply a collection of nerve roots that go further down within those lumbar vertebrae. If we look at a cross section of the spinal cord, we can see that it follows a very similar pattern to other portions of the brain. The white matter of the spinal cord is located here on the outside, and the gray matter of the spinal cord is on the inside. Directly on the outside of the spinal cord, we have a pia matter. Then we have the subarachnoid space where the spinal fluid is found. Then the area of the arachnoid matter. Then the dura matter. Then we have a little bit of fatty area. Then we have bone. Very similar to what we saw with the brain itself. These two roots represent the two different areas coming out of the spinal cord. So we're going to blow this up a little bit more so that we can see some more features of the spinal cord. When the vertebrae are here, it's very easy to see. Here's the body. So this is the anterior or ventral side of the spinal cord. Here's the spinous process of the vertebrae. So this is the more posterior or dorsal side of the spinal cord. When we do not have the vertebrae, we have to look for this dorsal median sulcus and this ventral median fissure. See how this one goes deeper? That's the fissure. Now if we blow it up, we can see it just a little bit more. Okay, So we still have the dorsal in the back and the ventral in the front. The gray area is separated into different horns. This is going to be the ventral horn, lateral horn, and dorsal horn. White matter is separated into funiculi. So this is going to be the ventral funiculus, lateral funiculus, and dorsal funiculus. The gray matter, matter is connected in the middle by what's called the gray commissure and then we have the central canal directly in the center. If we look at the areas of the spinal nerve coming off, notice in the back, in the dorsal region, there's a large bump. This is called the dorsal root ganglion. Remember that a ganglion is a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. The nerves extending out of the spinal cord are P and S. The spinal cord is C and S. The gray matter and the white matter differ in their functions. Gray matter is not myelinated, so it is only going to be responsible for sending information to other gray matter. The white matter is myelinated, so it's going to be responsible for sending the impulses into much farther directions. So if something comes into the area of thoracic vertebrae number 12, sensory, that needs to go to the brain. It's going to travel all the way from that thoracic vertebrae through white matter. It's not going to travel through gray matter. It wouldn't get there in time. 
the dorsal, let's go ahead and flip slides, the dorsal area or side of your nerves and your spinal cord is always responsible for bringing in sensory information. Once these two pieces connect together, this is a spinal nerve. So the spinal nerve itself is a two-way street. But when the sensory information gets here, it comes up through the dorsal root ganglion, goes to the dorsal horn of the gray matter. If this information needs to go to the brain, it then moves to the white matter and goes to the brain. Motor information comes from the brain down the white matter, then moves into the ventral horn of the gray matter where you have motor neurons, and then the ventral information travels out the ventral motor route into the spinal nerve and then travels down this side of the highway to go to the muscles. That is going to conclude our discussions of the central nervous system. After this, we're going to be moving into the peripheral nervous system and looking a little closer at what individual nerves are responsible for.